Turn with me to the Word of God this morning, and we're turning to Paul's little epistle to Philemon, please. Paul's epistle to Philemon. I have never preached from Philemon, and I'm often convicted about little epistles and things that I've never preached on. So say, how am I going to face these men in heaven if they ask me to give or preach from my epistle? But the Lord has led me to this uh, little epistle of Paul to Philemon, and I was reading it the other day. And I want you to come with me, please, to Philemon, and we're coming down to verse number 20. Now, Philemon chapter 1, well, there's only one chapter, but run your eye down, please, to verse number 20. Now, the apostle Paul is writing to Philemon, and he says, now, take your time and find the place. It just comes before the book of Hebrews. It's just there. And Paul says in verse 20, Yea, brother, let me have joy of thee in the Lord. Refresh my bowels in the Lord. Now, that's Paul's call to Philemon. Verse 21, having confidence in thy obedience, I wrote unto thee knowing that thou wilt also do more than I say. I see Paul's confidence in Philemon, and we can see Paul notices the conduct of Philemon in there in verse 21. But Paul is sure of the care of Philemon, because in verse 22 we read, But withal, prepare me also a lodging, for I trust that through your prayers I shall be given unto thee. Then there's Paul's charge to Philemon, verse 23, There salute thee, Epaphras, my fellow prisoner, in Christ Jesus. Marcus, Aristarchus, Demas, Lucas, my fellow laborers, and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. And we know that the Lord will add His blessing to the reading of His own precious truth. Many, many years ago, many years ago, an aged man, an old aged man, got into a horse-drawn stagecoach. And as this old man got into the horse-drawn stagecoach, he noticed that there was a female passenger there that was going to accompany him along the journey. He had never saw her before, he had never met her before, nor, nor she him. But somewhere along the journey, this female passenger began to hum. She began to hum a hymn. In fact, the very hymn she began to hum was our opening hymn this morning, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. And as she hummed at him, she noticed the old man. He was quite agitated by this, and just stopped. And she asked him, Is there something about that him that is troubling you, sir? He looks over to this young lady and said to her, if only but you knew who I am. Who are you, said this lady. With tears now in his eyes and rolling down his cheeks, he said, I am the unhappy man, I am an unhappy man who wrote that very hymn many, many years ago. If I had a thousand worlds, he said, I would give them all away just to have the blessed feelings 
that I once enjoyed when I penned that hymn. Come, thou fount of every blessing. You see, the old man's name was Robert Robinson. Robert, Robert Robinson was converted at the age of 19 through the faithful preaching of George Whitfield. He soon went into the ministry. He began to preach, first of all, for the Methodists. But he couldn't settle there, and he went on, and he, he went on to preach then along for the Baptists. And that didn't really settle the matter, and he went on then to preach for the Unitarian Church. And for those of us who know the doctrines of the Unitarian Church, they deny the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. Even though he was saved at the age of 19, he was a man who was never settled anywhere. He was always wandering about. And you know something, child of God, it's a dangerous thing to wander about, you know. You'll get people and they'll come and they'll settle down and They'll think you're the greatest place, and then the next thing they're away to somewhere else, and they're away here and yonder, and they never settle, you know. Well, I want to tell you something now, dear friends, what's wrong with today, and it was the same in Robinson's day. There's wee fellowships springing up everywhere, and they're teaching anything but the Word of God. I had a man who phoned me one evening, and he, I happened to ask him where he went till he used to go to Lurgan, and I remember asking him, where do you go now? Well, he, and he went to somewhere else, and then he went to somewhere else, and now, well, back then he told me he was going to a house fellowship meeting, and it's great, George, and the teaching's powerful. Well, so say, who are your elders? Well, we don't have elders. Well, and I says, who are your deacons? He says, oh, we don't have deacons. Well, I says, you're not operating as a New Testament church. And he began to get angry with me. And I says, tell me, this is the Word of God being taught? Well, we we'll read it and we discuss it. And I says, well, tell me this. You have a wee lassie. Someday your wee lassie is going to get married. And where are you expecting to marry her in the garden shade? And if there's going to be a funeral someday, where are you going to have the funeral in the patio at the back? I was talking to him the other day. Do you know where he is now? He's nowhere. The wee house meeting all fell through. And I'll tell you something now. You young people, will you listen to me now? Because I'm your friend as well as your pastor. If you want a place to go till you, make sure you go to the place where the Bible is preached. Authorized version. And you make sure you go where Christ is the center, not the pastor. I'll tell you, Christ is the center here, not me. Not me. Because there's every wind and wave of doctrine going about today, and nobody knows what to believe or where to belong. Well, I'll tell you, you belong where the Bible's been taught faithfully and where Christ is the center. And poor old Robert Robinson, you know, he died a wandering soul. The man who penned that opening hymn of ours this morning, he died going nowhere, a miserable, wandering soul. And you're saying to me this morning, George, what has this got to do with the reading? Well, I was reading this the other day, and the Lord brought not a verse to me. He brought not a a portion to me. He brought a name to me. And he said to me, I want you to preach in this fella that Lord's Day morning on, the, on, uh, uh, on this very morning. I want you to preach in him. 
And you'll find his name. And, and Paul the Apostle writes in verse 30, 23, There salute thee, Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, Marcus, Aristarchus, Demas. Now that's the name that jumped out. I want you to preach on Demas. Do you know the name Demas? It only appears three times in the whole of the Bible. It only appears three times in the New Testament. There's very little said about him, you know. Very little. But sometimes little said speaks much. You remember that? Little said often speaks much. And this morning when I began to look at this man called Demas, I began to think again of Robert Robinson because he was a young man who started out well. But the problem is, just because you start well, it doesn't mean you end well. And do you see Demas this morning, Demas? He's a warning to us all. When we're looking at Demas this morning, the Lord has something He wants to say to us. Well, there's something the Lord wants us to see in this fellow. And maybe what the Lord wants us to see in this fellow is what the Lord may perhaps want you to see in your life and in mine. Notice, first of all, what Paul here says about Demas. In verse number 24, Marcus, Aristarchus, Demas, Lucas, eh? this is how he describes them. My fellow laborers. You know, first of all, the Lord wants us to see this morning, as far as Demas is concerned, a perfect start. This young man started well. This young man started on fire. Paul described him. He's my fellow laborer. In fact, salute him. And when Paul looked at Demas and he saw Demas, he had high hopes for him. He respected him. He valued him. He's my fellow laborer. He's my companion in the work. Sometimes people say, when someone starts off with great potential, there's a promising future. When someone starts off well, what does that guarantee you? I'll tell you what it guarantees you. It guarantees you nothing. In 1936, the Olympics was being held in Berlin in Germany. Hitler thought that this was going to be the perfect stage for the master race. Hitler was surprised by Jesse Owens, who was a, a colored athlete along with others. It came to the day of the German, or sorry, of the 400 meters women's relay race. Hitler was there. They were the all-time favorites. They all lined up in their starting blocks, and the starting pistol fired, and the German first runner, the whole team, started well. Out of the blocks like a bullet out of a gun. They seemed unstoppable. They just grew further and further and further ahead, and the race continued, and the Germans were on their feet cheering the last one on, or cheering the second last one on, and as she was to change over the button, what happened? The one at the last dropped the button and stumbled. And the crowd gasped, and Hitler leaned over in the podium wherever he was standing and watched in horror as the favorite 400 meters German team were defeated. Defeated at the last changeover. Do you know what that tells me this morning, that way illustration? That tells me this. A perfect start doesn't promise a perfect finish. 
You remember that now. A perfect start doesn't promise a perfect finish. It's the sad story of many a Christian. Started well. And you know, Paul had high hopes for Demas. Boys, when Paul saw Demas, look at who he was with. Boys, what a great company he had. I'm telling you, to get a perfect start in the Christian life, you need to get yourself into the right company. You young Christians, you listen to me, because I was young one time myself, but I'm still young. But I got myself into the right company. Your company's everything. And I tell you something now, you can't run with a fox and hunt with a hound or hunt with a hound or run with a fox, whatever it is. You can't do it. People think, well, you can be a Christian on a Sunday and live whatever way you like on a Monday. Friend, I can tell you, you're not a Christian if you do. But look at the company he was with. Marcus, that was Mark. He was the man who penned the second gospel. Aristarchus, he was the man who accompanied Paul on several missionary journeys. In fact, he was a prisoner with Paul. Lucas, that was looked upon, man who wrote the third gospel, a faithful companion to the end. The proof is there. The potential's there, Demas. I love the company you're in, Demas. You're going well, son. You started well. But there's something the Lord wants us all to learn, and there's something the Lord always wants us to see, and it's this, listen, the Christian life is not a sprint. The Christian life is not a hundred meter dash, brother. The Christian life's a marathon. And I'll tell you, every marathon has its times of trials and struggles and problems. And in marathons, there's times you feel like dropping out, but you keep going on because you want to reach the, you want to reach the finishing line. You don't want to be ashamed of falling out. But so many of people, God's people today, have fell out. They're out of the race. Started too fast. Started too sure. You know what it's like after you get saved? Boy, you're going to save the world. I know I was, I know. Man, you were on fire. You nearly felt you were floating. But the unfortunate thing is, child of God, it doesn't always continue like that. Oh, no, no. You see, when Paul was writing to Philemon here, Philemon, take a good look at Demas there along with the old boys. He's a, he's a good one. He's a good one. He's my fellow laborer. Boys, he's a good one. He's, he's good. He's in fire. He loves the Lord. The joy's flowing out of him. He's good. He's a young man that had a perfect start. But when Paul was writing to the church at Colossae, the tune began to change concerning Demas. Because when Paul was writing to the Colossians in chapter 4 and verse 14, it says there, Paul speaking to the believers at Colossae says, Now look, look the beloved physician and Demas. That's all he could say, and Demas. Paul noticed when he was writing to the church at Colossae, Demas now had started going off the boil. His name was on the books, but that's all it was. And I want to tell you now, friend, we see Demas now on a perilous slope. You see, child of God, listen, this is a warning to me as much as it is to you. You don't go off the boil overnight. We can all go off the boil gradually. We can all begin to slide on the perilous slope Gradually. 
I'll tell you something now, backsliding is something that doesn't happen suddenly. Backsliding is something that doesn't happen overnight. It's a gradual event. And you'll only realize when you're backslidden when you've got that bit too far. I remember when I was growing up, I never opened my mother's gate. I jumped it. I hurdled it. And I had it all timed out over the, over the gate, two steps over the first flower bed, one step over the second flower bed, and three steps was the back door. Oh, Sebastian Cole wouldn't have a look in Beverly. And that's the way I'd done for years. Even after I was married, make myself feel good. I was up there visiting my mother there the other night, and I thought I'd have a go. I just opened the gate. <laughs> You see, it comes on you slowly until you realize where you are when it's too late. When Paul was writing to the Colossae, he says to the believers in Colossae, Demas, he's on the perilous slope. He's on the perilous slope because he's sliding away. Tell me, child of God, are you sliding away? You can get cold very subtly, very gradually. Demas, where are you now, Demas? I can't call you my fellow laborer now, Demas. Tell me this, child of God, where are you in your Christian life? Are you like Demas this morning? You're not running well now. I'm telling you, I'm not pointing a finger at you because I'll tell you why George McConnell is just as capable of slipping as anybody. This message is for all of us. What do you mean, George? How do I know? Well, let me put it this way. Some night you're at home, and it's Thursday night. Ach, I'll not, I'll not bother going to the prayer meeting tonight. I'll not be missed. Oh, you'll be missed because I know you, you're, you're not there. Have a wee sniff there. I'll not bother going to church this morning. Have a runny nose. Sure, I'll not be missed. Oh, you will be missed. Because I have every one of you sitting where you are, and I can tell you who's here and who's not here. And that's why some people get a wee text message. Are you all right? We're missing you at the meetings. Don't you think you, it goes unnoticed? But here's the sad thing. There was a time you never missed the prayer meeting. There's some now I can look at. You never missed a Thursday night, but you're no longer there now. Where are you? It was going well at the start. You see, these are all the telltale signs of being on the perilous slope. Church attendance. Maybe it's not as good as it was. Why would that be now? Because I'll tell you why you're in the slippery slope this way. And I'm saying this with all the love in my heart, and I'm saying this this morning because I could be in that place myself. I'm telling you, when you begin to miss meetings and 
Sure, nobody will miss me. Sure, what's one night? I'll tell you, that's the start of it. A downward slope starts off gradually. But you remember this is slippery. And it's easy going down the slope than it is trying to get back up it. And then there's other ways, mean you. There's other ways that you could find yourself for all the telltale signs of it been on the slippery slope. Maybe there was a time in your life when it would have killed you to tell a lie. It would have killed you. The thought of it, to tell a lie. Now there's believers who could tell a lie that would hang the devil and doesn't even bother them. I'll tell you when the Lord speak to us, the Lord has to talk loud at times. Demas, you're well off the boil in what you used to be. Is that you? Is that me? I'll tell you his name only appears three times in the New Testament. But I'll tell you there's a lot to be said about him. But here's the foolish thing. Here's the foolish thing. The foolish thing is, child of God, knowing that your heart's grown cold, knowing that you are on the slippery slope, knowing you are far from God, but you don't do anything about it. That's the sad thing. The sad thing is, child of God, is when we, when we know we're not what we used to be, and we know we're not in the prayer meeting as often as we once was. When we know we're not in the church attends as we once were. And we know, but we don't do anything about it. Now, that's the problem. That's the problem. You believers in Colossae, listen to me. Demas, his heart's not with me. He has the name of being a Christian, but he hasn't the nature of one. Demas. He has the, per the profession of a Christian, but he doesn't have the personality of one. I'll tell you, the Lord has a lot for us to learn from Demas. Would you not think so? But God's message finishes with a man who had a perfect start, but we're finished now with a pitiful scene. A perfect start, a perilous slope, a pitiful scene. Now Paul, he's writing to Timothy. And in 2 Timothy 4 and verse 10, he says this, for Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world. The man that once stood with me and worked with me and labored with me, he's nowhere now. He's forsaken me. I'm telling you, hey, Paul's piping a different tune now when he was writing to Philemon, Philemon, he was piping the Scottish jig. But now when he's writing to Timothy, he's now piping a sorrowful lament. I'll tell you the tune has changed. Has the tune changed in your life, dear? Has the tune changed in my life? I'll always bring myself down alongside you because I'm only human too. Because there go any of us but for the grace of God. I'm going to ask you a question. Was he ever saved? I'm not judging him. I'm only asking the question. 
because I'll tell you the time I got saved, there's one thing happened. My love for the, lo my love for the world went. In fact, it went before I got saved. You remember this, Judas? I was talking to our brother Mark, who's here this morning. I was talking to him about this the other day. Think of Judas. He was the least man out of the twelve you thought it would have betrayed him. Judas preached the gospel. Judas performed miracles. Where is he? He's in hell. Because the Bible says he's there. Having gone to his own place. I'll tell you the spotlight of Demas is on George McConnell this morning, maybe as much as he's on you. How much of Demas is in me? How much of Demas is in you? And if you know someone that once walked well, you remember this, don't you criticize them. And don't come to me criticizing them. Dear, help you if you do. And don't you condemn the mother. There was a young fella who ran about with me after I got saved. And his father was one of two policemen who were murdered by the IRA in Ballygolly in 1985. Colin took it well, the son. But unfortunately, he took it too well. And grief's a funny thing. About a year later, Colin went totally off the rails. Total haywire. You say to me, George, what do you do with a boy like that? Well, I'll tell you one thing you don't do to him. You don't criticize him. You don't condemn him. And I'll tell you, you don't preach to the mother. You don't preach to them. You don't do that either. About a year after Colin fell away, I met up with him and said, hey, boy, what about a game of snooker some night, you and me? And I just told him I haven't lost my touch to you for a game. He says, I will. Went in for a game of snooker with him in the wee snooker club there in Ochen I never said to him about the Lord, never mentioned anything about prayer meetings or nothing, never mentioned a thing. I'm going out through the door, I close, pull the door behind me, a door behind me, and he says, we have to do this again sometimes. I says, no problem. I'm your man. I says, if you're in for a stuff one, I says, you want a stuff one? He says, well, too, and do that. But you know how that went on for about maybe six months or more? And Tom Ross was having a mission in Ochnacloy Presbyterian Church. He says, hi, Colin, there's a wee mission going on in the Presbyterian. I'm going, I think I'm going somewhere, but I don't want to go on my own. He said, I wasn't going with Trace at the time. Say, when you come round, I don't want to go on my own, I will. Colin went one night. One night. Just one night. He wouldn't go any other night. But he, what he heard that night was enough, because two weeks later, Colin got back with the Lord. I'm telling you now, if anybody has went off the rails, don't you criticize them, don't you condemn them, and don't you preach at them. Love them and pray for them. Because I'll tell you, there's a wee touch of Demas in us all. Now, here's what the Lord wants us to see this morning through it all. You and I are not to live our Christian lives with the thought of how well we started. We are to live our Christian lives with the thought as to how well we are going to finish. Any man that's in a race, you're not looking behind you from where your starting blocks were, you're looking for the finishing lane. And you want to finish well because I'll tell you, a perfect start doesn't guarantee or promise a perfect finish. Don't, for goodness sake, live your Christian life with the thought of how well you started. 
you live your Christian life with the thought of how well you're going to finish. And God will bless you. Because Demas is a warning to us all. We're going to turn now to our green hymn books. 669, may this be our prayer this morning. More holiness give me, more strivings within, more patience and suffering, more sorrow for sin, more faith in my Savior, more sense of His care, more joy in His service, more purpose in prayer. May that be our prayer this morning because Demas is a warning to us all. The Lord bless you.